Alrighty. Well, and we've got some fading light, but we're gonna we're gonna kind of go through this as quickly as we can uh, before we completely lose the light and before it gets so cold in here <laughs> that we all freeze. So, uh, so what we're gonna do is we are in this season. This January is a month of fasting and prayer. So I hope that as you've been receiving the prayer blogs. There's, uh, there's been a little bit of teaching and a, in a, just a few pointers to kind of orient our hearts towards this season of prayer. And we'll increase that as we move through this week of preparation. And as Becky's already said, on Friday, we're going to be having the prayer summit, our first prayer summit. And that's going to be online. And, uh, and that's going to kick off two weeks of prayer and fasting. All right, so today I want to actually talk about fasting so that we can get our hearts right, our minds right, get our attitudes right, and just really start to prepare because it is something that needs to be prepared for. So uh, prayer is, uh, is just one of those things which, uh, you know, we, we, it should just be something that is as natural to us as breathing. And uh, one of those things that we, that we do at the beginning of every year is we actually dedicate the month to prayer at the beginning of the year. So it's like the first fruits. So we're giving God uh, our hearts. We're seeking him much more intentionally at the beginning of the year so that as we make plans and preparations for the year, God is able to speak to us and give us direction and guidance through these things. So prayer is a key discipleship practice that Jesus modeled for us. And he taught us how to pray. He taught us what to pray. He taught us when to pray and where to pray, as well as the many kinds of different types of prayer that there are. So Jesus actually in his life modeled so many different aspects and facets of prayer that we as his disciples, his followers, those who say, Jesus, I want to be like you, that we also can engage with him in the same kind of way and the manner in which he prayed. Most importantly is that Jesus modeled that prayer was not an event. Prayer is not an event. Prayer is a lifestyle. We see that Jesus had a lifestyle and a life of prayer. It wasn't simply an event. It wasn't a meeting. It wasn't a summit, right? It wasn't an event. It was a lifestyle. And that is what he modeled for us. So as disciples of him, what we're moving towards is that prayer comes out of uh, not, not just something which we do occasionally, but actually becomes more like our breathing, breathing. So as we grow and we mature in Christ, we will slowly change from being a Christian that prays into a person of prayer, just like Jesus. And that happens when we practice good habits of prayer. That's how that transformational process happens on the inside of us, is we actually have to engage in prayer habits. And as we engage in those prayer habits, it transforms our life and it becomes who we are, not something that we simply do. Now, one of the companion habits of prayer is fasting. And that is, of course, what our subject is going to be today. So what I want to do is I want to look at a couple of passages in the New Testament about fasting. Pharisees uh, were talking to Jesus and they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray. And so do the disciples, the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. Now, fasting is not something new, right? All God fearing Jews fasted. That's what they did. In fact, the Old Testament law had certain times in the year which were prescribed as fast. So they consistent times of fasting in the fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month, and the tenth month. 
So there was fasting actually scattered throughout their whole calendar. And so if you were a law-abiding Jew, uh, then, then you fasted. That was part of your spiritual uh, sort of annual cycle. Good people. So when, when these, when these uh, Pharisees and these spiritual leaders were looking at Jesus and looking at his disciples, they were confused because they knew that good people law-abiding people, those whose hearts were already turned to God, those people who were spiritual and holy, they fasted. Yet when they looked at Jesus and they looked at his disciples, they weren't fasting and Jesus wasn't teaching them to fast. And they were confused. They said, Jesus, why? Why are you? We know that you're a good man. We know that you're holy. We know you're a good teacher. Why don't you teach your disciples to fast? When all the ways that Jesus could have responded to that kind of questioning, he chose in his response to call himself the bridegroom. He called himself the bridegroom. And what he does in this is Jesus actually, in answering his question, also opens up a window on a greater revelation of who he is himself and who the church is. So there's much more, actually, in the response of Jesus than simply answering a question. You know, in in Jewish celebration times and and in their culture, uh, weddings were always times of feasting and celebration. And in a Jewish marriage, there was a celebration at a betrothal. So, So when somebody gets engaged, uh, today, you know, they, they say, you know, will you marry me? They give them a ring and, and, you know, they either say yes or no. Okay. But, but in those days, it was actually much, much more binding. So in fact, to, to break a betrothal, you actually had to get uh, divorced, right? It was much, much more binding. And so there was a celebration, the feast time that happened around this time of betrothal uh, in, in Jewish culture. And the bridegroom, what he would do is he would, he would get betrothed and they would have this feasting and celebration time together. And then the bridegroom would go away. He would go away either back to his, his parents' place or someplace. And what he would do is he would prepare a place so he could look after his bride. And he would go and make sure that he could provide for her and provide for the the assuming they were going to have a family and they were going to have children. So he went away to make preparations. And when he made those preparations, he would then come back for his bride. They would do the wedding ceremony and then he would take his bride to be with him and they would go and live together for the rest of their lives. That's the way that things happened in Jewish culture. The church is the bride of Christ. And we are living in the time between the betrothal and the wedding. Do you understand that? We know that Jesus has already come. We know that he sent his spirit and we are now the church, his bride. But Jesus has gone away. He's gone away to prepare a place for us. And he promised that he was going to come back again and he was going to take us to be with him. We know that we, the church, the bride of Christ, are in the time between the betrothal and the wedding day, between the marriage supper of the Lamb, when the church, the bride, and the bridegroom will finally be united forever. That's where we're at. And what did Jesus say when he spoke to the Pharisees? He says, in those days, they will fast. So Jesus has gone to his father's house, and he's preparing that place for us. So we're in those days where the church is meant to be fasting. Fasting is a necessary part of the bride of Christ then getting herself ready for her bridegroom. So if Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, as a church, we need to be preparing ourselves for him. And that's part of what fasting does. Fasting helps us prepare ourselves, prepare our hearts to receive more of Christ and be ready for him at his coming. Now, the early church understood this. And so they fasted and they prayed in preparation. 
Acts 13, verse 1 to 3. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Now, Acts 13 is roughly about AD 46. So if you know, follow any of the kind of the life, the, the sort of the timeline of Jesus' ministry, it was roughly AD 33 that he went and ascended into heaven. So we're about 15 years later into the life of the early church here. And what we find is that we have a band of Jesus' disciples uh, here growing up in the Jewish synagogue communities throughout Asia, right? They were growing up everywhere. Lots of people were converting to Christ, and they were still part of that Jewish community, but it was all kind of centered around that synagogue lifestyle. And here we find in Acts 13, we have a church in Antioch. And what do we find in Antioch here? We find a church that is worshiping and fasting. And normally we associate fasting with prayer, don't we? Well, here they're worshiping and they're fasting. In Psalm 63 and verse 5, it says, My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of food. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. So we find here that clearly the church was fasting and it was something that the believers did. And there was this kind of this, this understanding which they had uh, from the Psalms and things that, 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 that giving of their worship was like choicest food. And there's this, this link between worship and fasting. And I think probably what happened here in the early church is that they would have actually fasted before the worship service. And then they would have broken fast by sharing the Lord's Supper and then their love feasts together because that's what the early church did. When they gathered together for worship, they usually incorporated the Lord's Supper and a meal together. And so they were probably fasted throughout the day. Why? So they could prepare their hearts for worship, prepare their hearts for the Lord, and then come together and break that fast in celebration with Christ in the same kind of way that we've just done a minute ago. In the Antioch church, Paul was likely one of those teachers. That's probably, you know, it says there were teachers and there were prophets in Antioch. Well, Paul would have been a teacher. And Barnabas probably would have been one of those prophets. So we're looking at fivefold ministry here, the ministry offices. And that they would have they held those offices, both Barnabas and Paul would have held those offices before they became apostles. So they were already part of the fivefold ministry, Paul teaching, Barnabas prophesying and operating in those offices. And that's what they were doing. That was the ministry which they had within the local church in Antioch. And then we have uh, the Holy Spirit as they're worshipping and fasting, brings a prophetic message to this assembly that they'd have set apart Barnabas and Paul, or Saul, for the work which he's appointed them to do. And be as, they, as they're being uh, sent out by the Holy Spirit, to, to be an apostle simply means to be a sent one. So they're now transitioning from being prophets and being teachers. Now they're being appointed as apostles to go and we know then, of course, that Paul went to the Gentiles. So we find here that they're worshipping, they're fasting together as a church. And then the Holy Spirit gives them in that atmosphere of worship and fasting, consecration to God. The Holy Spirit then gives specific instruction to set apart people for a specific work of ministry. So what does the church do in response? Well, they add prayer to their fasting. <laughs> so, so they begin to seek the Lord in prayer and fasting. Again, it's a preparation of the heart. So we see here 
that the early church then used fasting and prayer to prepare the ministers to go out into the world to preach the gospel. So they knew that fasting was part of preparation. Preparation for fivefold ministry. Preparation for the church in sending them out. So as we look at the life of Paul, certainly as we read through Acts and we read through his letters, we know that Paul was the kind of person who had a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. It was something that he already did. It wasn't something that he learnt. He already had this. In fact, if you remember his conversion, right? So this was when he met Christ on the road to Damascus and he was struck blind. It says that between that moment of meeting Christ on the road to Damascus to, to, being, uh, to giving his life to Christ and being healed from that blindness, it says he didn't eat or drink in that whole time. Paul spent that time in fasting and prayer. Why? In preparation, again, for what God has done in that encounter time. This was such a, a, a moment, a watershed in Paul's life. He marked it with fasting and prayer. A consecration set apart his life to God because of what God had done for him. So Paul was a faster and Paul was a prior. Fasting is a shortcut to spiritual maturity. It's a shortcut to spiritual maturity. In actual fact, there are no shortcuts in the kingdom. There's only long cuts, right? If you actually live your life according to the way that God prescribes, that actually is the shortest route between A and B. We tend to make it much, much longer than it actually is necessary. But fasting is one of those ways that from our perspective, it's a shortcut to spiritual maturity. You know, in the Western world, we think that a shortcut to spiritual maturity is getting a degree from a Bible college or a theological seminary. And it's just not true. That isn't the way that we gain spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity comes through the development of godly character. That's what leads to spiritual maturity. And the Bible tells us that one of the quickest ways to develop Christ-likeness is through suffering and persecution. And all the people said, <laughs> right. right, that's what the Bible tells us. One of the fastest ways to spiritual maturity is through suffering and persecution. And we are suffering today, are we not? <laughs> we have no lights on in the church, all right? So, fasting is self-imposed suffering. Why is it self-imposed suffering? Because it's the denial of the flesh. That's what fasting is. We're denying our flesh. When you deny the desires of your flesh, the flesh suffers. It grumbles. It complains. It rebels. How many people here have this, this sense of joy that they're about to go into a season of two weeks of fasting and prayer? No, in fact, you have fear and trepidation around that because you're going to have to deny your flesh. The flesh doesn't like it. Fasting is self-imposed discipline of suffering because we deny those things that are appealing to the flesh. We deny the, the luxuries of our flesh, the things which we use to pacify and soothe ourselves with things other than Christ. And we don't like that. But that's what fasting is. When these desires and addictions are subjected for a higher purpose, the spirit grows stronger. It's a well-attested fact that those who practice fasting, that fasting trains your soul to resist temptation. Did you know that? If you've, been, if you've fasted regularly in the past, you'll know that. You'll know that through experience. It teaches you and trains you, your soul, to resist the temptations that the enemy throws at you. So the question is, is there a stubborn sin in your life that you just can't get mastery over, no matter how hard you try? 
Is there something there? Is there, does there, does there seem to be a stumbling block that trips you up again and again and again? There are times and seasons where you seem to get victory over these things, but it keeps coming back. Things like anger, judgmentalism, addictions to work, alcohol, drugs, food, pornography, and the list can go on and on and on. There's all sorts of things that, that just seem to be so stubborn that they hold on to us. You know, even though we desire to get rid of them and, and, and throw them off, you know, they, they just seem to stick so readily to us. The creation intention for humanity was that the body and the soul life should be under the subjection of the spirit. That's the way God intended it to be. He created it that way. That our spirit, which had communion directly with God the Father, would have, would have mastery over our soul life and our bodily, fleshly passions and desires. That's a creation intention of God, the way he made it to be. But of course, we know that through the fall of humanity, our spirit was cut off from the life of God. And the result of that was that the soul life and the flesh life took ascendancy over the spirit of man, which was supposed to be in control. And so we find that as, as fallen beings with a fallen sinful nature, it is our soul life and our fleshly desires that seek to have mastery over our spirit. And that's what we find. You know, our fallen Human soul is like an immature three-year-old. All of you have had kids. You know what three-year-olds are like. They're just old enough to be self-willed, don't they? Right? Just old enough to learn to say no. Right? They're not quite wise enough yet to know that it's better to do what mum and dad says. And so we find that our fallen human nature, our human soul, is very much like a stubborn, rebellious, cantankerous three-year-old. What needs to happen to that? Well, they need to be disciplined. That's how, you, that's how you teach and you grow and you nurture a three-year-old to know the difference between being stubborn and self-willed and actually learning that compliance and obedience is actually far better for them in the long run than being self-willed and stubborn. When we become born again, through Christ Jesus, our spirit is born again and reconnected to the life of God. And therefore, through the Holy Spirit, we have and should, through the maturing of the Christian person, allow our spirit then to take ascendancy once more over our soul life and over our physical life. So that once again, our bodies, soul, and spirit then come underneath the subjection of the Holy Spirit. That's part of Christian discipleship. That's, again, falling back into line with that created order. If you've tried to overcome your stubborn habits and sins through behavior modification and consistently failed, then you have probably been trying to use the flesh to overcome the flesh. So I'm going to suggest that you try using your spirit to overcome the problems of your flesh. Because you'll probably have better results. Because that's the way that it's meant to be. So fasting trains your soul to resist temptation and strengthens your spirit by relying on God. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. This is a well-known passage because Jesus quoted it at the end of his 40-day fast when he was being tempted by the devil to turn stones into bread. It reads, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In this passage in Deuteronomy, Moses is addressing the new generation which was born in the wilderness 
in the 40 years in that desert. And he's explaining to them that in the desert, God put the nation of Israel on an enforced fast. He caused them to fast by restricting the amount of food which they had available to them. And he did that so that he could feed them with bread from heaven, which was the manna. God led them through a season of hardship and suffering in order to teach them and us, because all scripture is for our benefit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> <laughs> All scripture is written for our benefit and for edification. So what happened to them was also instructional for us. So God did this and led them through a season of hardship and suffering in order to teach them a valuable lesson. And that valuable lesson is one that transcends the temporary hunger and discomfort and produces a harvest that lasts for eternity. That's what he wanted to teach them. Physical food sustains the physical body. But how much do you know that we aren't simply base human beings? We aren't creatures that just rose from some primordial soup. And neither are we animals that live to satisfy our base instincts. We are more than simply natural human beings. We're more than flesh and blood. We also have spirit. And God has put his spirit in us, into our human spirit, so that our human spirit can feed on spiritual food. And that is the word of God, who is Jesus, the bread of life. Turn to John 6 and verse 53 to 58. Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood. You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Verse 57, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. You know, the world teaches us that there is nothing apart from this physical life. Well, the world is lying to you. The world says that when we die, it's over, Red Rover. So everything the world teaches you is that you need to satisfy your desires now because this is the only chance that you're ever going to get. How different is Jesus' teaching to us? From his perspective... It's about eternity. For Jesus, eternity is, is the way that he sees things. That, that life is not just this physical life that you live in, but actually there's something which is going to go on into eternity. His flesh is real food, and his blood is real drink. The real things for Jesus are the things that we partake of now, that will endure into eternity. I got news for you, everybody here. Your body is going to die. Okay? Just in case you are wondering, right? Each one of us is going to taste death. Your body and your spirit, however, your, sorry, your soul and your spirit will live on. Where it lives on depends on whether you have received salvation, the life of Christ. Remember verse 57. Just as the living Father has sent me and I 
live because of the Father, so, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. For those that are saved, they will be, as Jesus says, raised up on the last day. Their spirit will inhabit a new body that will inherit the earth. For those that have rejected Jesus and trusted in the world for their salvation, their spirit will remain disembodied and spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's what the word says. So fasting, what fasting will do is fasting will decrease our hunger for the things of this world because we abstain from them. And as we abstain from them for a period of time, And with regularity, what we find is the attachment that these things have on us become less and less and less because we're not feeding our our fleshly desires anymore. Fasting will decrease our hunger for the things of the world and increase our hunger for Jesus, who is the bread of life. As we satisfy our hunger by eating snacks... You have no appetite for supper. We know that. If you eat before a meal, well, you're just not going to eat the supper that's been set before you. If we snack on the things of the world and satisfy our fleshly desires instead of feeding on Christ, then we'll have no appetite for Jesus. That's why we fast. We fast so we train ourselves to put aside the things of the world which are temporary so that we can feed on the things which are eternal, which is the spirit of God in Christ Jesus. And as we do that, we will find that we will attune our appetites for the spiritual things of this world and not the fleshly things of this world. While we fast, we put aside the necessary food of our flesh and we eat the spiritual food that Jesus gives us by abiding in him and he in us. When we abide in him and he in us, then he will become the delight of our spirit. So fasting is not about not eating. Fasting is about eating the right things. And we need to be eating from Jesus. Let's read Deuteronomy 12, verse 2 to 3. Destroy completely all the places on the high mountains on the hills and under every spreading tree, where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. God commanded the Israelites to remove idols from the land they were inhabiting so they would not become a stumbling block for them. So they wouldn't run after them and do the things which they did because their worship practices were despicable. They had all sorts of immorality that went hand in hand with their worship practices. And God says, I don't want any of that. I'm not asking you to worship me like that. And it will become a stumbling block to you unless you pull those things down, pull down their altars, cut down their Asherah poles and remove them completely because those are detestable practices to me. It's not how I've called you to worship. An idol is anything that holds our affection higher than that of God's. You know, we were created for worship. That's what we are. We're created as beings to worship God. That is our purpose for humanity. So we can't help it. It's our nature to worship. So the question is not, if we will worship, but what we will worship. While we may not have idols or statues or other gods in our homes or gardens, I hope we don't. (laughs) While we may not have statues and idols in certainly in the Western culture, I mean, sadly, that's changing. Okay, but I'm 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 going to take it as read that we don't have these things in our homes. And in our gardens. Nonetheless, we cannot escape the desire to elevate things to the place of worship. We just do and we will. Music idols, sport idols, idols of entertainment, computer gaming. The list 
It will go on and on and on and on. Whatever it is that captures our heart and our affections above God's is an idol. Any time that we have biblical values that get superseded by the things that we listen to, the things that we watch, the games that we play, there's a good chance that we are building an altar to an idol. What do I mean by values that supersede those? I mean that, are you listening? Have you been listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit over the content of the things that you watch, over the games that you play? Have you squashed the conviction of the Spirit so that he no longer speaks to you in those things anymore? You know, I was thinking about that, even in terms of sport. You know, we have seen an increase in blood sports. MMA is violent. Do we delight in those things? Yet we would never dream about hitting another human being. So what we do is we, we allow this fantasy life of the things we watch, the games that we play, the, the, the sports that we enjoy, or hold values which are very unbiblical and things that in the natural we wouldn't ever think of doing. Yet we allow ourselves this fantasy space to indulge in those things and we enjoy them because of what they do physically for us. And we've, we've building very subtly, we're building an altar to an idol because we're not being consistent in the values that we understand that Christ is giving to us and allowing those to flow through every aspect of our life. Why? Because we're made to worship. Because we're built for worship. And we will always worship something. There will always be some temptation inside of the heart of man to raise something above God himself. Have we squashed the conviction of the Spirit so that we no longer hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us about those things. Well, fasting is the way that we cut down the Asherah poles in our life. The way that we look and examine are those things in our hearts, those, those foundation stones and altars that we've been building to these other things that take our affections. And through fasting and prayer, we actually pull them down. We pull them down because fasting breaks up the foundations of these things that have a hold on our heart. So in your time of fasting and prayer, be asking the Lord, are there any idols in my life? Is there anything that's holding my affection too high, Lord? And allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you again because he'll be sure to tell you because he's a jealous God. He's a jealous God and he wants the singular affection of your heart. In this uh, time, this preparation time of fasting and prayer, as I said, we've got the online prayer summit coming up on Friday at 7 p.m. And this kicks off our two weeks of, of, of more intensive fasting prayer. We should already be praying. Okay, We should already be uh, giving ourselves a devotional time and a consistent time, which was the last blog that went out, consistency in our prayer life. So we should already be praying, but it kicks off a time where we're going to just turn up the intensity of this just a little bit. So I'm going to give you some practical advice, which I have gone on uh, in more depth in another message, which uh, was at the beginning of last year uh, when we were doing the Nehemiah series. So I've already given some, some more practical tips on fasting and how to do that successfully. Uh, so what we'll do is when this goes on to record and we put it up on the internet for the rest of the church to hear, uh, we'll also put a link into that so that you can go and review those as well. But uh, one of the things is what is sensible? What is sensible when it comes to fasting? Fasting is a spiritual discipline that takes training. You don't run a marathon, okay, when you're unfit. And fasting takes spiritual training. So don't think that you can do a two-week fast if you haven't done a 10-day uh, a ten, a ten fast before you even attempt a two-week fast. 
And don't think that you can do a five-day fast if you've never fasted for one day or three days. So what we want to do is we want to try to build this as an athlete would take their training seriously. In the same way we should be taking our spiritual disciplines seriously mm -hmm. because we're strengthening our spirit man. And we're putting to death those things that so easily beset us. So if you've got a medical condition, consult your doctor on what is an appropriate fast for you. Again, we want to do this what is sensible. Mm. Okay, if your doctor says it ain't good for you to fast, find something else to fast. Don't yeah. fast food. Do what is right for you. Mm. Okay? So be sensible about it. What is achievable? Again, you can't, you can't run a marathon without training. So whatever it is that you choose to do, can you do it? Is it something that you can do? And can you stretch just a little bit more than what you do? You know, when you're going down to the gym, all right, and you, you've got your, your five reps that you do every time, well, for the two weeks, do six reps or two sets of five. Do something which is stretching you just a little bit further. Is it achievable? What do you need to do, but also allow you physically to sustain your job? So if you work a hard physical job, okay, uh, not eating for two weeks might impair you from your job. So pray and ask the Lord, what's achievable, what's sensible for me in doing this, but what will be a little bit of a stretch? We want to decrease distraction. Are you addicted to distraction is something that I've seen increasing, not only in my own life, just because of the things that I have in my life, right? With our online digital age, we uh, become so much more accustomed to distraction that actually it can be a, an addiction. And I found that, that latching onto my own heart at times where I become addicted to distraction. It's a way that we avoid reality. TV, phones, busyness, all these things can be a way that we, that we just crowd our life very deliberately because we don't like our reality, right? We, we, we don't want to stop and think and meditate or do any of those things. We actually want to make sure that we, we've got so much noise around us that we get to avoid those things. God says, be still and know that I am God. So we want to spend these two weeks pushing aside distractions. We want to increase our devotional time. We want to be feeding on Jesus. We want to read the Word of God. We want to meditate on the Word of God. We want to journal the Word of God, which is part of that meditation practice, and even write your prayers down in your journal. Because as you do, you'll find the Holy Spirit just, just, just breaks open things for you and can speak to you in, a, in an even clearer manner than normally. If you already do this once a day, you might want to try to increase this over the two-week period to twice a day. We have, uh, in our household, we now have Wednesday evenings dedicated to worship. So we turn the TV off and we have Worship Wednesday so that we can devote ourselves more fully to God and create not an altar to the things of the world, but actually create an altar to worship to God in the midst of our home. So that's a way that you could increase by decreasing distractions, turn up the volume of your praise and worship music and start to worship God in a more intentional way. There's lots of ways that we can increase our devotional time over this two weeks and ask Lord, is there an idol in my life? And as we pray, pray for the Christ-like character to be wrought inside your heart because that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to grow in spiritual maturity. We want to grow in depth of our spiritual life, not simply go on a diet. That's not fasting. It's about what we feed on. And we need to be feeding on Christ in the midst of this. So we want to cultivate that hunger in prayer to be more <laughs> like Jesus. So uh, during this two-week period, 
starting on the Monday uh, after the weekend, after the prayer summit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a prayer altar at 6.30 a.m. every morning during the weekdays, Monday to Friday. And you are able to join me online and we will have a half an hour where we pray together for the church, for the coming year, for you. You might have some prayer requests and things like that, but we're going to open up an altar of prayer at 6.30 every morning. So if you're able to join us for that, then I would I would say this is an opportunity for you to create good habits of prayer early in the morning like Jesus did. Amen. Create space for fellowshipping with one another in prayer, feeding on the Lord and just increasing our devotional time during that two weeks, the remaining two weeks in June.